Welcome to CB8 Speaks. My name is Ellen Pallavi. I'm a member of Manhattan Community Board 8. This is the first of a two-part series on Roosevelt Island issues. Today we will focus on a fascinating subject, Cornell Tech. Red is the color of Cornell University. Coincidentally, red is the accessory color of Roosevelt Island. A red tram, red buses, red signs, even our garbage cans are red. <laughs> now you might think that sharing a common color might be a good start in town gown relations. But when we learned that the behemoth Cornell was going to be our neighbor, building a graduate engineering school and a small city at the tip of our island in three phases over the next 25 years, Roosevelt Islanders were pretty terrified. Cornell was a formidable developer. It appeared to many that the city invited them to create a Silicon Valley East. They had the blessing of every elected official in the city with the promise of thousands of additional jobs and billions of revenue being generated. Who can argue with that? They came to Roosevelt Island with a lobbying team that has a deep political reach. Then there was us, the Islanders, trying to protect our health, our safety, and our daily life. We have only one street. How will all the building materials and equipment get to their construction site? Who will pay for the extra stresses on our infrastructure and services that the additional 7,000 people bring? These were a few of hundreds of questions that arose in thinking through merging our two cultures and a major construction project. Today, it is my pleasure to introduce to you two very interesting people with fascinating backgrounds who helped tremendously in the community effort to gain concessions with Cornell. They are fellow community board members and co-chairs of the Roosevelt Island Committee and Cornell Tech Task Force. Jeffrey Escobar is an attorney specializing in real estate at the law firm Proskauer. He is current president of the Roosevelt Island Residents Association, which Roosevelt Islanders shortened to RERA. Larry Parness was for, formerly deputy director for the Department of City Planning. Larry knows all there is to know about zoning and development. He and Jeff were a big help to the community board during the land use process called ULERP with Cornell Tech. Both of you are relatively recent community board members. Why do you think you were appointed? Uh, I mean, I can speak personally for myself. I think that a couple of factors came into my appointment. The first is that the community board, I think, was looking for, or the borough president was really looking for, younger members to join the community board. So when a seat had opened up, I think that was already on their radar. Coming from Roosevelt Island, I think, helped as well, but also being from the northern part of the island, an island that's been, you know, Mis or not underrepresented, I would say, throughout some city politics and um, city administrations that uh, for at least myself, I think it became much more of a, a factor in my appointment. Um, notwithstanding, I think my background in just land use development and real estate and construction it probably helped a little bit as well. Larry? Yeah, I worked at city planning for almost 40 years and I really specialized in, in land use. Uh, when I retired in 2009, I wanted to keep my involvement but from the other side, from the local community side. So I filed an application with the borough president uh, to be named to the community board. And in the spring of 2010, uh, the borough president appointed me to community board eight. And I would just say, I think that's what's interesting about both Larry and I, is that both of us have, in land use and development and construction, have always been on the other side of the community. Right. I mean, I represent, my firm typically would represent developers and owners and projects and whatnot. Um, but I very much joined the community board and am involved in the community because I wanted to represent the interests of the community, just to think, as Larry was saying, um, with his past professional experience being on the side of the city. Great. Larry, I've heard that the ULERP inspires terror in the hearts of developers. What does the acronym ULERP stand for? ULERP stands for the Uniform Land Use Review Procedure, and it was created as part of the charter changes that were adopted by the voters in November of 1975. It went into effect in July of 1976 and basically it's a standardized review process uh, for certain types of action that require discretionary approval by the city. Uh, and it provides a standardized process and, it, uh, and it's applicable to both private projects and city projects. Right. Would you tell us a little bit about how the process goes? 
Yeah. Uh, as I said, it's standardized. Basically, what what the process involves is review, starting with the community board. The community board then it holds public hearings and adopts a recommendation, sends its recommendation to the borough president. Borough president sends its rec his or her recommendation to the city planning commission. City planning commission ha has a public hearing and adopts a recommendation and forwards it to the city council who has the final decision on the application. It's interesting to note though that 95 percent of the development in the city is not developed through Euler. So if you develop as of right and comply with all the underlying rules and regulations, you're not subject to the process. So the process only takes place when, there, when you're out of zoning or when there's not an as of right? The charter building. includes a list of items that uh, require, sub, uh, require Euler. If you're asking for a zoning change or a special permit, if you um, require a uh, Site selection, if the city is looking for a site, such as uh, the infamous marine transfer station, that is subject to ULERP. The city has real property that it owns. If the city wants to sell it, that's a ULERP process. Um, leasebacks? Was it a leasebacks city wants, Well, the city wants to lease. There's, there's two different kinds of leases. If the city wants to lease long term, uh, that's subject to Euler, but the city wants to lease space for office spaces, there's a separate process. But in terms of um, private actions, it's largely the zoning actions that come through because of you, because it's, because it come through Euler. So how long does the Euler take? Once the process formally begins, it's 185 days, 60 days at the community board, 30 days at the um, borough president, another 60 days at the um, City Planning Commission in 50 days at the City Council and then there's a time after that where the mayor has the ability to um, veto actions of the council. The problem with ULERP that many developers are concerned about is, is that the actual time clocks don't begin until the Department of City Planning certifies an application is complete. And the front end where the City Planning Commission reviews the application to make sure it's ready to go through the process has no time frames. Right. And that's where most of the questions and concerns from the developer arise because they want to get through the process as quickly as possible and with no time, for, uh, no time limits at, that, at the pre ulerp stage, uh, it's costing them money and time uh, to get to the, begin the formal process. Right. So for my experience, the, the ULERP entailed many hours of public hearings. And if, if you follow the ULERP around, there are, there are many public hearings that people have an opportunity to go to. I'd like to bring this to Jeff. Jeff, you effectively influenced a small group of us in, in RERA, the Residents Association, to organize a bigger group in the community consisting of all the island organizations, including RERA, into a community benefits group called the Roosevelt Island Community Coalition. We called that RIC. The purpose of this group was to negotiate with Cornell. It took a year effort in a tag team of people to form this group, which was finally operational the month before Euler began. For full disclosure, I have been the co-chair of RIC. Um, Jeff, what is a community benefits group and what was your hope for it? Sure, I mean, just kind of a little bit of background and history. I mean. Community benefits groups, and specifically uh, community benefit agreements, which is ultimately the goal of a community benefit group, um, is a practice that has uh, really espoused itself nationwide, in which communities come together um, with the dis differing disparate groups to represent a single interest in negotiating with a developer. And the reason why you do that is that um, you want to create some sort of binding agreement with a developer as to the delivery of promises benefits for the community. It was used largely first um, out west uh, with the development of the Staples Center, uh, the stadium in which the local community had sought to, when the Staples Center had been constructed to seek from the developer a number of concessions. Uh, everything from you know, using union labor to uh, in funding for local schools because there was a community that was being displaced at that point in time. 
locally speaking, you know, the use of community benefit organizations and community benefit agreement um, is one that is tracking the national trend in which communities uh, surrounding large projects have come together and tried to you know, uh, lobby a developer to give them consents or to give them concessions uh, for, be, for, again, for coming into the community and creating a, a disruption, for lack of a better word. Uh, the most recent ones are the, you know, up in uh, Columbia with the Columbia redevelopment and expansion um, up on the Upper West Side, um, and also the Barclays Center. Um, there is a, a very effective community benefit agreement in place there. Using those models, uh, basically, uh, what, as part of RERA, and when RERA was first looking at this issue, he had brought up his Real Estate and Development Council to really, and Construction Council to basically say that this has been a trend um, that's been used nationwide to get developers to come to the table um, to basically secure um, and ensure that the community itself is safeguarded, that it's receiving some sort of benefit, uh, an exchange thereof for the uh, use of the land, for the disruptions causing around the community. And I saw a benefit to be added to use the same process here uh, with Cornell. So what I'd advocated for and how to make an effective agreement, quite frankly, be binding and to give these organizations standing. So you have to cut a large swath across the community. It can't be merely one segment of the population. It, for RERA, it had to be beyond just RERA. And so what I had encouraged uh, the group to do is to form an organization um, with all of the community groups at the table uh, to be a singular voice. This is also, you know, coming from the other side, from a developer side, it becomes not only, it becomes both easier and harder because it becomes easier in the sense that you have a single entity that you understand they represent what the community interests are. Um, as I've always said, developers are not bad people. You know, they are people who are looking to help the community grow in a vision that they see for it. Um, but it becomes harder for them because, you know, some of the other tactics that would be used i.e. satisfying one community group and you know, making other concessions, um, it basically is short-circuited through this process. Uh, so you know, I had strongly encouraged the community to do so. Um, and I guess, you know, quite frankly, the founding members of RIC heard and heeded the call. Uh, and in, in all respect, I think we got a very good poll, a very large consensus of what the community wanted. So you advised RIC to create a term sheet by polling the groups in their organization. So Rick gave each member of the organization a questionnaire about their wants and their needs in regards to Cornell and compiled the whole list into a master list of requests from everyone dealing with Cornell, what they wanted from Cornell. And this became our Bible. With this, we hand it out to everybody, in, to every organization, every elected official, every the to Cornell, to the community board, to everybody dealing with Cornell. So we all were working off the same master list. Mm -hmm. It was very helpful. Mm -hmm. now, um, well, if I could add from the from the community board's perspective, um, m many of the localities that have these community be benefits agreements don't have a formalized process like we have in the city and uh, on community in New York community board is sp specifically granted by the charter the responsibility to uh, make recommendations on behalf of the community we at the time we had only five Roosevelt Island members right. on community board five and certainly all of the other members couldn't have an idea about the issues from from uh, Roosevelt Island as they reviewed the project and without the community coalition that you and, and, and uh, Ellen and Rick and Jeff uh, worked on, um, community board could not have done uh, the job it did in terms of ultimately issuing a recommendation to the city planning commission. And that's something very important because we've seen at the community board when we've had items before them where somebody from the neighborhood will come down and speak in favor and somebody will, will come down and speak in opposition. but. The Roosevelt Island Community Commission came and spoke as one voice, and that was extremely important for the community board. I, I will say, though, I mean, in other community boards, the, you know, the community board out in Brooklyn, the Upper West Side Community Board, I mean, they very much, whether it was lobbying of individual members or not, I mean, re remember that those were a 
those community benefit organizations were also very much espoused in the support of that community board. You know, they had they had given the the, the chairs of those boards to you know, meet the outreach, recognize that there was this need, and recognize and said, yes, please go ahead and form that. We'll interact with right. you. We have you as that, that charter. You know. So what we did, I think, Community Board 8, is that because there wasn't that chart, we made that charge ourselves on, on Roosevelt Island, which I think, again, Community Board 8 was very in support of because they recognized that there was this common in community interest. Um, but it's also very important because it also recognizes that there is the, uh, the process within the city, the ULER process, um, that, require, that really needs this kind of consensus, this consensus building. Um, and at the end of the day, whether you agree with community benefit agreements, community benefit organizations, or RIC, or what the Community Board 8 had done, the one thing I think nobody will disagree with is that it was successful in forming the consensus necessary for smart development of the project. Agreed. Cornell, although they appreciated having one solid voice, they consistently conf refused to see us as us, meaning RIC, as a legitimate negotiating group. Although they did send a few people to sit with us at the table and to give us some concessions, those people did not have the authority to make final decisions. They consistently refused to sign an agreement with RIC. They would only sign an agreement with the community board. Was this a disappointment to you? Yes and no. I mean, you know, at the end of the day, what, we were, what I think RIC was really looking for, and I think you would have the most success at is when you have a binding signed agreement between the negotiating entity, um, and, not, and in no disrespect to Community Board 8 at all, but having a signed agreement, which binding agreement uh, between um, the community benefit entity and the developer itself. But at the same time, it was a disappointment in the sense that they didn't, uh, was it a disappointment because they didn't sign it? You know, we look at the end product, and at the end of the day, at least there were, they came to the table and did listen and did use uh, the, ben the community benefit organization to really understand and key in on what the community wanted. And so at the end of the day, that was answered, you know, and that was utilized. So it's a mixed bag. You know, as an attorney, I would want you know, a signed agreement, and I would want something in which the developer between two private entities would have agreed to it. Um, it's been useful and it was helpful um, up, again with the Barclays project. It's been useful and helpful with the, uh, with the Columbia project. Um, and I think it would have been beneficial here to a certain extent. But at the same time, I think what ended up happening was it, it, it not to say that Cornell didn't recognize RIC as a negotiating partner. I think it just took them time to come and realize that what Rick was doing is what the community board was behind, what the city council was behind, and whatever every other part of the community constituency was behind. If I recall correctly, though, when when um, with the Columbia projects and the Barclays Center projects, uh, even though the community benefits agreement agreements were directly signed by the developer and the community benefits group, the requirements for those agreements were folded into the approvals by the Absolutely. city council. Right. Um, so in the case of Cornell, um, there um, were requirements that uh, community ben the community coalition had asked for, that the community board had asked for, that were made part of the approval uh, when the city council voted. Right. So ultimately, we ac you accomplished that goal of folding in what the community wanted into the approval. You know, the, what you have is you have a second arm, quite frankly, a private recourse um, that would hold the developer accountable, which is what the larger benefit of, of having a community benefit agreement in place would be. And the right. enforceability. The enforceability, mm -hmm. right. Too. Because yeah. at the same time, if you didn't have that, then it's left to the city to, quite frankly, right. prosecute. And so it would make, mean the community, again, would have to go out, petition city council, petition the city law department to uh, say, look, this is the you know this was the enabling uh, legislation that allowed the project to move forward, and they didn't fulfill X, Y, and Z, and then it's up to the city to re whether or not they want to you take that you take that decision enforcement process out of their hands, or not necessarily out of their hands, but you have a secondary right. position that they would fall back on to enforce those uh, those concessions. You see, 
we were terrified that we didn't have a signed binding agreement. We meaning Rick and the community was terrified that we didn't have a signed binding agreement and that the agreements that Cornell gave us um, through the community board, so, so the community board lists, um, would be would be somewhere in the city, you know, stuffed away in a city file cabinet, and Cornell could decide whether or not they wanted to give us those, cons you know, do it later on. Especially we were having a change of administration. Right. Who would know what they agreed to? So. And and we didn't have any authority. We didn't have any standing as a community because the agreement was was made with the community board, with the city, and ultimately the agreement was made with the city in the lease. Uh, if if we hadn't had REAC, which is for our viewers another a, a different arm of govern governments in Roosevelt Island specifically, part if we didn't two have of this. part two of this <laughs> series. Uh, if we didn't have REAC to step in for us and continue the negotiation and put some binders, you know, some binding agreements in place to enforce the city agreement, we would not have a way of enforcing what the city and Cornell s signed. Right, but I would, you know, I would argue, and I mean, quite frankly, my thought process in this whole thing was knowing that that was there and that that was for lack of a better word, the third bite at the apple, uh, that that last leg was there, um, was really the reason why I think it was okay and why when questions arose as to whether or not, you know, because we don't have a signed agreement in place, this is a bigger issue, is that, you know, we were working in concert with you were, uh, both, or you, Rick was working in concert with both the city and with the REAC, you know, to ensure that somewhere along the line, at the end of the day, all of the concessions were going to be folded in, and they were ultimately folded in. I mean, they were folded into both the leasehold with the city, they were folded into the enabling uh, legislation, and they were folded into the lease agreement with the REAC. And so, you know, at the end of the day, they're, they're there. Um, so let me, let me jump in here because we have time constraints. What would, you, what would you advise a community listening to this tape that to do if they didn't have a REAC to jump in and, and have their back later on? How would you advise them to, uh, to memorialize an agreement so that it can be, it can be acted well, upon well, later on? From a procedural point on them, mm -hmm. uh, um, depending on the actions that are going through ULERP, there are other places where some of these uh, agreements can be memorialized. Um, we didn't have those uh, type of actions at, uh, at, on Cornell. Uh, a lot of these are memorialized as parts of uh, restrictive declarations or special permit conditions which are made part of the approval. Uh, but we didn't have that mm -hmm. here in, uh, in Cornell. Um, but it's very important for the community to organize, um, speak as one, uh, work through their elected officials because the elected officials uh, were very, very helpful in, in the Cornell project and can be very helpful in their projects. And if necessary, some community groups have gone out and hired their own attorneys and hired their own and, and consultants to right. negotiate on their behalf. Mm -hmm. Right. And I would say is that if that, if that wasn't, if there was not a REAC, there wasn't the city in concert working together, is to uh, really petition the community to basically not accept the development to come forward unless there was a key benefit agreement. I mean, you know, Barclays, the LA the Staples project, people came out in droves, had protests, you know, basically forced the developer to come to the table if not if they didn't sign. So if you didn't have those supports, that's probably the biggest mechanism you have available because nobody wants, as I've always said, nobody wants to build in a place they're not wanted. And so if it made it very clear that the community did not want them there, but they wanted to have the project, that would, I would say that, that would probably be the best and only way to be able to do so, um, is to ensure a unified voice and ensure one that is leveraging the entirety of the community against the developer. So I would say looking into what other groups got, what kind of benefits, education, um, types of, what kind of group, what did other, peop other groups get? Like education, health and welfare type of concessions, money? Mm -hmm. What else? Yeah, I mean, a lot of uh, other communities um, in their projects were able to get everything from 
you know, improvements of their local infrastructures mm -hmm. to, um, you know, funding of education in schools, um, ensuring certain type of labor were a certain type of labor was used. I mean, it was basically whatever was on the table, and that's why the term sheet was created um, to have negotiating points. And so, those were really largely been benefits in other communities. That's great. Thank you, Larry. Do you have one last thing to add? In relation to Cornell, I think mm -hmm. as, as a resident of the island and a member of the board, and again, from a procedural process, um, I think the, the community did very well. Mm -hmm. um, of course, we did not, Rick did not, nor did the community board get everything that it, um, it uh, requested and recommended. Uh, I would have preferred to see that everything, uh, all construction materials be brought on, brought on by barge, not the best efforts of Cornell, which, by the way, they, they have um, so far um, followed through on that. We, we have really seen practically no trucks coming on the island during the demolition phase of the Cornell right. site. Uh, we're getting two and a half acres of publicly open space. Uh, I think Jeff maybe could add some of the free we benefits. Have, we, have the to okay. we have to stop. We have to stop now. Thank you, Larry and Jeff. This is very interesting. This was part one of, of a two-part series on Roosevelt Island issues. Uh, please stay tuned next month for part two. Please tune in then. Thank you for joining us. Mm -hmm.